Okay. So before I get started, I need to give a huge thank you to all my co-authors. Um, without them, this would not be possible. And a huge thank you to everyone not listed on this slide as well. Um, everyone who caught even a single fish without you, I couldn't have done my thesis. So a huge thank you. Um, and then of course, a huge thank you to all the funders um, that have allowed me to, that have funded my research. <laughs> um, so I'm just gonna give you a bit of an overview of how I'm gonna talk about things today. So we know the title of my thesis. I'm gonna do a general intro um, about what I'm gonna be talking about. I'm gonna dive into the two chapters uh, of my thesis and then just do a wrap up at the end um, to kind of get why, why did I do any of this really? So we're gonna start with the general intro. So recreational angling is something that is practiced for le leisure all over the globe. It is a million dollar industry. And in many cases, it is considered to be less detrimental um, to fish populations compared to commercial fisheries. There are many things about recreational anglings that, there's, that we still don't know. There's still so many questions that we ask that need to be asked and need to be answered um, in regards to recre recreational fishing. Um, but more specifically, my thesis is focusing on catch and release angling. Um, so catch and release angling, if you're not aware, is when fish are returned to water. This can happen when anglers go out of their way to go and practice recreational angling, kind of like bass tournaments, or when um, someone is practicing catch and harvest fishing, um, but they need to adhere to size requirements. Um, so they put fish that don't meet those requirements back into the water. And during these catch and release events, um, injuries occur sometimes to the anglers, but I'm gonna talk about the injuries that occur to the fish. So just a bit of a background here um, in regards to um, physiological effects of catch and release angling. Um, there are a lot of sub lethal effects that occur during catch and release events that we just aren't really sure what is happening or why things are happening. We know that water temperature, unhooking time, and air exposure definitely increases stress. Um, and we do have some techniques and technologies that can be used to evaluate these stress levels. So in both of my studies, uh, we use something called RAMP, which stands for Reflex Action Mortality Predictors. Um, and I focused on using um, equilibrium. So maintaining, see if I fish, uh, flip the fish on its belly, can it go back? Um, if I fish it, <laughs> flip it on its back, can it go back to its belly? Um, when I grab its tail, does it burst? And it's ocular movement. So if I rotate the fish, are the eyes moving with it or is it just still? So as you can see in this video here, this is a pretty tired fish. It's obviously very stressed. It's been through a lot. So I flip it here, I flip it onto its back, make sure it makes it back to its belly. I also then do a tail burst grab here uh, uh, after this and make sure that it can swim away and it's good to go. So we know that that fish hopefully is gonna make a full recovery after catching it. So um, one, the big thing about my thesis is we want to reduce injuries and mortality and also stress in a way um, so we know to do this, we need to decrease air exposure. And a way to decrease air exposure is to make the unhooking time very quick and also minimize any hooking injuries that can happen and hopefully come up with a strategy that makes unhooking time shorter and thus making lower ex air exposure. So knowing that about hooking, one thing we don't know is any strategies to decrease bleeding. So that's another thing I'm gonna talk about later and you guys have probably already heard about the Mountain Dew slash Coke project. So you're gonna hear all about that shortly. So just a bit of an overarching idea. Um, the goal of my thesis was to identify different strategies for mitigating injuries. Um, and to do this, I investigated two things. The first one, if replacing treble hooks on lures with single hooks reduces injuries in fish handling times. And if using carbonated beverages reduces blood loss of gill injuries. So we're gonna start out with that first one there. So like I said, catch and release, it's huge. It's practiced by many anglers, but we have the question, what can we do to minify these injuries? Because when you catch a beautiful fish like this, one, you want to catch it again or hope someone else does, but two, you want it to go and succeed when you release it back into the water. You don't want it to die or be injured and then something else happens to it. So the objective of this study was to look at replacing the hooks on these hard plastic lures. We got three kinds. Does that reduce injury and fish handling time? So I'm gonna come back to the slide in just a second. So what did we do? Well, we went angling, it's great. Um, we focused on three different species, Northern pike, smallmouth bass, and largemouth bass. And we captured on three different lures, like I just mentioned, crate baits, 
jerk baits, and lipless crankbaits. Um, and then we paired those up with four different um, hook types. So we have treble barbed, treble barbless, single J barbed, and single J barbless. So back to this slide here. These are just um, jerk baits. On this slide, I think you can see my mouse. Um, on this uh, upper one here, there is a treble hook. It is barbless. So just imagine the barbed one is going to have barbs. And then the J hook over here is the single J hook. Um, it is barbed. So imagine the barbless just doesn't have barbs. So then once we got the fish into the water, we put them in a water filled trough and we got their total length. Then we recorded all of these variables. So we got the number of hook points that were in the fish, how long it took to remove all of those hook points, whether or not um, any hook removal gear was used, whether it came out by hand or um, just on its own. Um, we took the depth of all the fish and then subsequent, subsequently, um, we took the average of all those depths as well as looked at the deepest hook um, for each fish. And then the ramp that I mentioned previously, we looked at that and um, whether or not there was immediate mortality. So for number of hook points, this varied from one to five um, across all species. Uh, however, we did not find there were any significant differences um, in um, hook points, whether it was the lure or the hook type we used, it didn't change um, for any of the species. On the other hand, hook removal time varied from zero to 305 seconds. And we found that hook type did have a significant effect. And this is for the Northern Pike smallmouth bass and largemouth bass. So we found that treble barbed hooks had the longest unhooking time, whereas J barbless um, hooks had the shortest unhooking time. And then treble barbless, you can see here on the screen, treble barbless was after treble barbed and J barbed was, um, uh, yeah, after, after treble barbless. For the use of hook removal gear, so this would be pliers or hemostats, um, we didn't find any significant differences between any of the lures or hook types for any of the species. However, we did notice that it was more likely that hemostats or pliers were being used to remove hooks in Northern Pike. And that just probably comes down to the fact that if uh, anglers want to avoid um, getting injured by Northern Pike, you can lip a bass. Um, you shouldn't <laughs> lip a Northern Pike. If you do, you're a brave soul. Um, but it's just to avoid injuries uh, of the anglers, not necessarily always to remove um, deeper hooks. Um, for average hooking depth, um, I'm just gonna focus on the smallmouth bass. They were the only ones that had post hoc differences. Um, so for the, hooking, um, for the hooking depth, we measured the depth of the hook from the snout of the fish to the, um, to the hook. And then that was corrected for body length. It was taken from the snout of the fish to the tip of the tail, which is total length. Um, so for smallmouth bass, we found that single barbless hooks were more shallow than treble barbed and barbless hooks for both crank and jerk baits. And we actually found the same thing again for the treble, uh, for the deepest hook, sorry, in crank and jerk baits, we found that treble barbless, um, the order of the deepest hook was treble barbless, treble barbed, single barbless, and single barbed, which is very similar um, to the hook removal time, the treble are on the longer side and the single or on the shorter side, or in this side, or in this case, shallower, uh, deeper and then shallower. For uh, our reflexes and immediate mortality, that ramp score I talked to you about, um, out of 569 fish, we only had six Northern Pike that were euthanized due to their low ramp score. So they didn't have one of those three um, things I mentioned earlier. Um, and we actually found that there was a significant effect of hook type detected on ramp score for Northern Pike. Um, so this can give us kind of the assumption that treble hooks negatively infect um, pike's reflex reflexes. So essentially, what are the conclusions I can make from this study? Well, you, we can make the conclusion that using J hooks, especially barbless ones on lures that are traditionally have treble hooks should be considered um, when encouraging best practices um, for freshwater game fish. So that's the, the smallmouth bass, largemouth bass and northern pike. You know, if you want to try and decrease unhooking time and air exposure, take this into consideration. So now I'm going to move on to um, the big, <laughs> the big media study. So asking the question: Do carbonated beverages reduce bleeding from gill injuries in angled northern pike? So deep hooking is something that happens quite a lot in recreational angling, especially catch and release. Um, sometimes it can be minor, and sometimes it can be major. We had hooks that went just as deep as 235 millimeters into um, the fish from the last study. So we know that these hooks can get, 
caught in the gills and the gullet, which make them one harder to remove, but also increase the likelihood of gill filaments and the gullet being injured and eventually or even causing um, bleeding. So what can we do about that? Well, we can do my first study. So prevent deep hooking from occurring. So reduce deep hooking um, injuries from happening, or we can try and stop the bleeding once it occurs. So there's been lots of research, not necessarily a lot. There's been a little bit of research done, but nothing has been successful. And a lot of that research has been done um, on online forums and isn't very, uh, isn't a very good scientific design and usually nothing, um, nothing comes from it. So we found a YouTube video that went absolutely viral. Um, and it was this guy who used Mountain Dew on a bleeding bass, put it back in the water and said, hey, look, it swam away, it's all good. And then this was taken by um, some guides that also write journals in big, um, in big magazines and in big journals online like Outdoor Canada. Um, and we're promoting it to anyone and everyone that would listen. And then that was taken on some by some Facebook people and they make pages and they promote this um, to be used on the unicorns of freshwater muskie, which, you know, if this works, great. If it doesn't, well, that's not great. <laughs> and then we also have um, some people on the other hand that say, hey, don't do this. So we wanted to say, well, do you pop it or do you drop it? If you're not Canadian, um, soda and drop it. Um, but I think most of you are Canadian, so pop it or drop it. So what was our objective? Well, we wanted to see if using carbonated beverages like the ones advertised Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola actually helped um, the fish in any way. And we would compare this to a control. So that way we would actually have a decent scientific design that you can't really argue with. So again, we went angling and we did this in two parts of the summer. So we did this in May when the water was about 11 to 18 degrees Celsius. And then we also did it in August where the water is about 24 to 27 degrees Celsius, just to see if there was a difference between the two. And once we get the fish into the water, again, we would measure them. And then I would simulate a gill injury by cutting a gill filament, which you can see on the screen here, it's about one centimeter by one centimeter. Um, and then we had a controls where we did nothing to the fish. Um, so essentially didn't pour anything on them. We had uh, another control where it was carbonated lake water, just using a soda stream. And then we had Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola which we, um, which were the two main carbonated beverages that we found online. And then we had three variables that we used. So our three variables were the gill color um, for the proxy of blood loss. So this is actually just paint chips um, that we put in order and each gave a number and looked at the relative change over the course of 20 minutes um, of the gill colors to um, evaluate the amount of blood that was lost or whether it stayed the same. Um, and then we have bleeding intensity, which um, varied from zero to three. Zero would be absolutely no blood at all. Three, it would be gushing blood very, very intensely. Two, less than three, one, more than nothing. And then we have bleeding time, which was recorded just with the stopwatch from when we would apply the treatment to when the bleeding would completely stop. So this is how we broke down the first part of the study. So we had a baseline where we did not cut or pour anything just to get that baseline gill color so we could compare it later on. Um, we had our control where we didn't pour anything on the fish. We just kept it in a white bottom cooler for 20 minutes to kind of see um, the, the, how much time it took bleeding. So then we could compare our, com our carbonated beverage treatments back to um, the control here. And then, like I said, the three carbonated beverages was carbonated lake water using a um, soda stream, Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola. I used about 150 milliliters of Mountain Dew and Coca-Cola that we poured on the fish. I would also like to mention um, that a lot of the videos you see online, they're holding the fish up and pouring um, the Mountain Dew or the Coca-Cola or whatever it is down the fish gills like this way. If you're holding the fish up like this, we kept the fish in um, the trough um, just to hopefully minimize some potential air exposures that would affect, um, affect the fish. So then the second part of the study, this is what um, we call the koozie or the cooler part of the study. So again, we had our baseline and then we had our control yet again. And then we had our cooler Mountain Dew, which, would which we would put on ice in a cooler to kind of simulate you having a cold drink uh, on a cooler with a boat with you. And then we had our koozie Mountain Dew, which we would just sit out on the boat with us to simulate you having an open beverage kind of sitting by you on your boat. And then again, that was um, 150 milliliters um, poured 
over the fish scales in the troughs again. So here we have bleeding stop time and there is not a significant difference between any of the treatments here. Um, this is for part one, so no significant differences here. For the second one, um, there's no significant differences again um, between the control or the cooler of the Koozie Mountain Dew. And then we have the gill color for a proxy of blood loss, which we looked at the change from zero to 10 and then 10 to 20. And, that, and that's what's graphed here and the relative change is that number scale I was chatting about before. Um, so there's, although it may look slightly different, there's no significant differences here between any of the treatment, treatments um, or the baseline. Um, if you wanna see this later, I can also send it to you. Um, and then here is for the second part of the study. Again, although they might look a little bit different, there was no significant differences um, between any of the treatments here. And then we have our bleeding intensity values. So we separated um, that before I poured anything. So it would be cut, we take a bleeding intensity value. We pour, take a bleeding intensity value at three minutes post pour, or sorry, post cut, we would then take another um, bleeding intensity value. And then again at five minutes. If the fish exceeded five minutes, it was noted, but no uh, additional bleeding intensity values were taken. Um, so here, you can see that obviously before and after the pour, right after I cut um, the gills, it's bleeding pretty intensely. They're about a three um, across the board. Three minutes post, it decreased. There's a lot less bleeding. And then five minutes, the control has stopped bleeding completely. Um, and it is important to note here that um, at five minute post, the control isn't bleeding anymore, but the three carbonated beverages is. It's something to just kind of keep in the back of your mind. Um, and then for the second part um, of the study that we did later, um, there was less bleeding um, with the before and after pour. Um, and there was no fish that were bleeding um, at five minutes post the pour. Um, but again, just to kind of keep in the back of your mind, um, the Mountain Dew, um, both the cooler and koozie were the only ones still bleeding at three minutes post, um, post the cut and the pour. So I would like to mention that there was 1% of the fish that died throughout this study. Um, however, that was not a significant amount of fish that died, but it is something to kind of keep in mind. And so what are the conclusions we can make? So there's no evidence that we found that using carbonated beverages is beneficial, but bradycardia may give the impression that it is. So essentially bradycardia in very, very simple terms is the fish stopping its heart or slowing down its heart rate. So when these people are holding up their fish, air exposing it, which induces bradycardia, and then pouring something on it to wash it away, it may look like the fish is not um, bleeding. And then you put it in a dark bottomed lake or river, whatever it is, and you let it swim away, you're not gonna be able to see that contrast between um, the blood and the bottom of the lake. Another thing to mention that we um, observed during the study is that after transferring the fish from the trough into a cooler, um, the gills, the gill plates would stay shut and they it would look like the fish was trying not to breathe essentially. And then about after 30 seconds, its gill plate would open back up really big and it would start gushing blood. So this, this is bradycardia. But because we were holding it for 20 minutes and we had it in a white bottom cooler, we were able to see that contrast, which is something when an angler releases it within, you know, 30, 30 seconds uh, after catching it and after, you know, or causing an injury and bleeding, you're not going to notice that because the, the fish has got its gill plate shut. They're not going to be able to see um, one, the contrast, but also see the event, the bleeding actually continue. Um, so that is just something to keep in the back of the mind, although we did not find um, significant evidence against it. We didn't find significant evidence for it. And we also saw that observation. So essentially it gives us the idea that, you know, keep the pot for yourself. So just a general conclusion now, um, from my first study, a big take home message is consider replacing those, um, those treble hooks that you buy in the store bought um, hard plastic lures. Consider putting a single hook on them. It doesn't affect the way the lure acts, um, it's just, it could be beneficial to fish long-term. Um, and then keep the pot for yourself. Um, you know, don't waste it. Uh, keep your Mountain Dew um, for you. So future studies, I'm just gonna get into this um, pretty quickly here. It would be really interesting, I think, to look at the long-term effects of using single hooks to see if there's actually, a, 
if there's anything more beneficial um, than just reducing air exposure, like does this um, increase reproductive fitness compared to using treble hooks? Um, what are the effects on the long-term survival of these fish? And then I think what a, long, a lot of anglers wanna know, what's the recatchability of these fish if I'm switching to a single, single hook? It, am I gonna be able to catch this fish you know, down the line? Um, I also think it would ver be very cool with um, my background in biomed to look at the physiological effects of doing the do. Um, so to really get down into the gills and see if there's any um, disruption of equilibrium or even just like the ions and the fact that how the gills work, it'd be, I think, very interesting to see what is actually going on in there. Um, and then finally, look into other um, possible solutions, I guess, for bleeding, um, like G-Juice, and one of the people in our lab might actually be looking at that, so it'd be um, interesting to see. So G-Juice is essentially something that anglers put in their live well during um, bass tournaments, and they say it keeps the fish full of energy and keeps it going um, until weigh in and then helps them swim away after. So I just wanna see if that's something that is actually one good, but two, um, could it be used as a possible solution? And then in aquarium fish, Mel Melifix is actually used to treat um, infections and bleeding. So I wonder if that actually has any effects on freshwater or um, game fish that you could potentially use that instead of doing something like pouring Mountain Dew on the fish. And then I'm just going to show you here. I forgot to click this. Here's some pretty bass. Um, so essentially, my study is just, you know, we want to keep catching these guys. So what can we do to help them? And that's all I got. I can start reading these questions. 